Hi everyone. Today I'm with Ian Redmond, um, who has an OBE um, and a lot of best friends who are gorillas. Uh, he's a Yorkshire lad, but was born in Malaysia. And he's a biologist by training, but he's actually a natural born um, naturalist. Um, and but he's a conservationist by necessity, and it, in, it's it's not been a, a, a an easy thing to um, look at and and try to fight the things that you've seen, isn't it? Um, and why what's made you become a conservationist hasn't really been the happiest of things for humanity. But I'll let um, Ian explain uh, a little bit. <laughs> Poor him. He's got to fast forward his sort of life, very rich life story, including David Attenborough and God knows who. Um, but introduce yourself um, and um, let us know your tip afterwards. But hi, Ian, thank you for coming. No, thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, I, I, I describe myself as a reluctant conservationist in that mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been my career of choice, but um, it certainly is necessary for people to understand the importance of conservation. And in fact, I, I'd rather people didn't become professional conservationists, but that they bring conservation into their everyday lives. So whether you're a nurse yeah. or a doctor or um an accountant or, or an engineer especially if you're an engineer <laughs> civil engineers really have to understand ecology yeah. um so uh, yes um i had the good fortune um uh, as i was um in the final year at university uh I, I took on the job of organizing the speakers for the biology society uh, which is great because you get to invite people that you think are doing interesting work and they come and talk to the society and one of them i put up in my flat overnight um, called Sandy Harcourt, who was writing up his PhD on gorilla behavior, having spent two years um, working with Diane Fossey. Now, at that time, Diane Fossey was not the household name she became, um, but uh, he gave me her address and gave me some tips. And I wrote to her and said, if you want someone to uh, mend the roof or make the tea, Sandy has said that if you can mend things, mention it, because um, if you live in a cabin in the middle of a forest in, on a mountain in Africa. If something breaks, it stays broken. <laughs> it turns. I am a compulsive fixer. I can't help fiddling and trying to fix things. Yeah. So yeah, um, I wrote to Diane. She said, "If you can get here, we'll try you." And uh, getting to Central Africa was interesting. But um, yeah, I got there, and um, since then, I've just been trying to keep up. You know, people talk about my career. I don't think of it as a career. Stuff happens, and I try and keep up. Um, and among the, the things that have happened is um, I, I've studied gorillas and, and elephants uh, and, and the animals that live inside and on gorillas and elephants, because I think parasites are fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had individual animals who I'd come to know and who trusted me and, and I regarded as friends uh, killed by poachers, um, who in their minds, I'm sure, were, were making an entirely logical decision. Mm -hmm. um, someone was prepared to pay me money for a bit of this animal, the gorilla's head or hands, the elephant's front teeth, and I haven't got any money. So I don't mind doing that if it can achieve my objectives, which might be to pay the school fees for the kids or um, yeah. you know, buy groceries or, or, or go out with the lads and get drunk, whatever. Mm -hmm. If they haven't got money and they need some money and, and somebody is prepared to pay them to do things even though it's illegal and, and if they thought about it, they might not actually think it was their first choice of uh, career. Um, that's where, where life pushed them. And, and I, I sort of maybe dwelling a little on that because uh, a couple of years ago, I, I took some journalists to Rwanda. It was 40 years since the transmission of that famous BBC series, Life on Earth, yeah. uh, which was a, an amazing 13 part series where David Attenborough took us through the whole of life on earth from single celled organisms and coral reefs to primates and elephants and, and us. And yet the one sequence out of that 13 hours of, of top notch blue chip natural history filming that people remember is when he met the gorillas. And, and you introduced all, them to the gorillas. Oh, by good luck and good management, I happened to be the, the gopher at Karisoki, the research center that Diane Fossey set up. And she said, go for the BBC. And I went and got them and brought them up to camp and took them out to the gorillas, not knowing that we were making television history. We were just making a short sequence for the primate program where David Asimov wanted to talk about the importance of the opposable thumb. Uh, but that happened just a few days after one of our study animals uh, called Digit, whose portrait actually is, is usually behind me. But instead, you've got 
some of the children and grandchildren of those gorillas um, because I went there with the mirror journalists to meet the gorillas that David Attenborough met, uh, the youngest of whom was now an old lady gorilla called Poppy, but she disappeared just before the trip and instead we met the children and grandchildren of the gorillas who met David Attenborough and that's who you're looking at behind me. Um, and I mean that's a wonderful story because um, yes, D Digit, the young silverback, who I knew well and I considered a friend, was killed and decapitated by poachers because some mm -hmm. foreigner wanted to buy a gorilla skull and a pair of hands. There's no accounting for some people's idea of a gruesome souvenir. Um, yeah. But Digit's death was a, a sort of milestone in, in gorilla conservation history because it focused yeah. the world's attention on what was happening to mountain gorillas. And uh, Diane's gift to the world was, was not so much the research results which she gathered or the films that were made about her, but the fact that she learned how to win the trust of wild gorillas. And trust is so important in our life. You know, you can't have a relationship with someone unless there's some sort of mutual trust. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, aren't you scared when you're sitting near a family of gorillas and the silverback's three times your weight and 10 times your strength? And it's, well, you know, if you go out for a drink with a wrestler, you know he could hold you down and do a lot of damage to you, but you trust each other. Oh, yeah. And likewise with, with gorillas, once they understand that you're not a threat to them, they're as curious about you as you are about them. They will want to come over. And, and now we don't allow that close contact that used to happen because of the risk of disease transmission, which is especially important in the time of a global pandemic of, of a respiratory virus that, that is easily transmissible. So now if you go and see gorillas, it used to be seven meters, the attempted minimum yeah, distance, yeah. now it's 10 meters. Yeah. And, and now no one questions the need to wear a mask so that you don't cough or sneeze and accidentally infect the gorillas with a human uh, disease. So yes, g gorillas played a big part in my life. And, and in terms of connecting with nature, I mean, they are in connection with nature. And um, Diane used to ask me why I, why I wore shorts when I was in, the field, when the, the field, the forest is full of nettles and thistles and brambles, all of which we have in our gardens. And, and anyone who goes into a, uh, an overgrown patch of garden and tries to tidy it up, effectively you're being a gorilla, a mountain gorilla, because gorillas eat the nettles and the bed straw and the thistles. And many of the plants that we think of as weeds are actually quite nutritious. And while yeah. nettles and thistles are difficult because they've, they've got these defensive mechanisms, stings and spines, um, you can make a pesto out of nettles and garlic and lemon, and it's delicious. I know, it's Just funny. It up so that the stings don't affect you. Um, mm -hmm. Gorillas seem able to cope with the stings and they'll, they'll munch on the leaves. And so they're constantly in contact. Did you with... ask you about the shorts and why did you say, oh, you did it because you just wanted to be like the gorillas? <laughs> no, I, I guess I, I've always felt connected with, with, with nature and plants. I like to go barefoot. Now, you can't go barefoot if you're on patrol in the forest. Um, so so I wear you're boots, like, but yeah. the best part of the day is when you take your boots off. And, and now I, do, I, I just wear sandals in the forest, uh, which mm -hmm. protects your feet from the worst of the um, sharp thorns and things. But, but um, a few years ago, I had a blowout. One of my sandals came apart. And so I took the other one off and, and walked barefoot in the forest. And it feels fantastic because you're squelching through mud and it's coming through your toes. And as long as you avoid the spines and the thorns, it actually feels wonderful. So uh, I, I would say to anyone who wants to connect with nature, get your shoes and socks off, give your feet a bit of air and then walk on grass or, or, or on soil and just notice the different textures. Barefoot walking, if, if you if you maybe carry your sandals with you so if you get to some very rough ground you've got some yeah. protection but walking barefoot you get so much more sensory input and I, I just think it's good for the brain or, or we are a tactile species we've got these wonderful sense receptors in our fingers and toes and yet much of the time we cover them up we put our feet into little boxes we put our hands into gloves and we seal ourselves off from nature we cover the earth with tarmac and concrete so it can't breathe and water can't percolate into the ground it runs off and creates floods because it's not getting the normal natural um, absorption and, and runoff so we need to make an analogy of that with our with our stress and if we, we, we're blocked from anything flowing then that you know 
know, yes. and, and I think that the consequences are often very subtle, mm. but they are important. Mm. So people talk about grounding, you know, letting whatever um, static electricity builds up in your clothes and your body. If you step on the ground without a rubber layer beneath your feet in the ground, the static goes and you feel better. Mm. So th there are ways to connect with nature that don't require you going to Africa and sitting with gorillas. Um, and, and the fact that I've got them behind me is, is kind of cheating. Um, but I have the good fortune to have that as a sort of a mental happy place. Mm. So if I go into a forest and sit in a glade, not only am I sensing the forest immediately around me, my memory is full of experiences where I've shared that experience with a bunch of non-human beings. And we're so, you know, most people think human being is one word. No, it's two words. And if there are human beings, you have to accept the possibility that there are non-human okay. beings. And I think yeah. gorillas and elephants and dolphins and certainly all the large-brained, long-lived, intelligent species with whom we share this planet um, are, are Im important ethically. Um, and beyond that, they're important ecologically because of the role they play in the forest. Mm -hmm. People have this idea that, oh, there's a forest and it might or might not have some an animals in it. If the animals have been removed from the forest, you haven't got a forest. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of trees, but, but the animals play important ecological roles. And so I, I talk a lot about the gardeners of the forest. And I'm I not love talking that about talk. humans, yeah. I'm talking about the animal gardeners mm -hmm. um, who, who prune the trees as they pluck leaves to eat them or yeah. eat the fruit and then poop the seeds out the next day, miles from the parent plant, wrapped in a nice package of fertilizer, they're dung. And if, if it's a gorilla, it's often created a nest in a glade or has built a nest in a tree, which folds the leaves into a ball. So it's like folding an umbrella, which creates a light gap. So what does a seed need? It needs nutrients and light and water. Well, they live in a rainforest, so the water isn't a problem. And the nutrients are the dung, which rots down into compost. And the light is because they've built the nest in a glade or they've created a light gap by building a nest. So apes are really important for tropical forest ecology. And yeah. most people who think about you know, why we should protect apes, think about it because they find them interesting or, or they find them beautiful or their babies are cute. Or all these reasons that are very anthropocentric. I, mm. we like yeah. them or find them interesting rather than biocentric they're important for the earth. And that's something which this year, especially with the, the UN Convention on Biodiversity meeting in China next month in October, 2021, mm. it should have been last year. And COP26 the, of the uh, climate talks uh, meeting in Glasgow in beginning of November, 2021, should have been last year. Last year, 2020 was supposed to be the super year for nature where humans kind of redefined the way we relate to the natural world. And it, before we got to do that, nature bit back. It bit back, yeah. And, and this virus has, has changed the way many people think and interact and behave. And perhaps it's useful to have pause for thought. So oh, this year, 2021, is the super year for nature, where we define what, what in UN speak United Nations speak is the post 2020 biodiversity framework, mm. which is the, the sort of the concept, the policy document that is supposed to guide governments over the coming decades, which should allow nature to restore itself. Mm. It's not so much what we do to nature, it's just we stop doing stuff to it okay. so we can regenerate. And that's, that's our goal this year to, through the climate talks and the biodiversity talks, help to heal, not the planet as a whole, because that's mostly a ball of rock. It's the thin layer of life, the biosphere, which mm. coats our planet in which we live mm. and on which we depend, mm. that we have been destroying for decades, centuries even, not that many centuries, a couple of hundred years, we've been really hammering the planet. Mm. So the UN has declared this year is the first year of the decade of, of ecosystem restoration. Which means this year, the first year. I, I wonder, you know, why hasn't it happened anyway? Well, well, yes, well, it, it should have happened a long time ago, and we wouldn't have been in quite such dire straits okay. if, it, if it had. But it's not too late. Nature has an amazing healing power, and, and we just have to stop doing the bad stuff and give it a chance to 
restore itself. And in, in places, we can do good stuff too. People yeah. talk about planting trees. Well, that's great, but a, a tree is going to take centuries to become a mature tree. Mm. So we could just stop cutting down the centuries old trees. That would be a good idea, wouldn't it? After here. Allow them to do what they do. Mm. I love the, the 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 gardeners of the forests. Um, sorry, the story that you were talking about and how the elephant the elephants as well. You were talking about the elephant dung and and the, the, the when I visualised the elephant dung with loads of new trees sprouting in it. It was well, really I, mean, I can, I can visualise it f for you by showing you <laughs> photographs of, not when it's fresh, but yeah. after a few weeks, after right. it's been rained yeah. on and the insects have broken it down a bit. And it's, it's like a, a, a seed bed in a nursery, in a human nursery, but it is a natural nursery for seedlings. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's true, most of them are going to get eaten by dikers and, and small mammals. And, and then when they get to a bigger si si sapling size, they'll probably be eaten by elephants. And this is one of the fascinating things that has only recently been discovered. Uh, an Italian biologist called Fabio Berzaghi studied two patches of forest in the Congo Basin, one where there were forest elephants and one where they'd been wiped out decades ago. Yeah. And what he found was that the above ground biomass, the woody material, which of course is mostly carbon, was about 7% more where there were elephants compared to where there weren't elephants. Wow. And that's why there's a new enterprise called Rebalance.Earth, which is hoping to market that elephant difference and allow the elephant benefit to restore to other parts of the forest where they've been extirpated so that we gain back that 7% difference because we haven't got enough land to keep planting more and more forests. We need the land for agriculture or for other human activity. So let's make the forests we've got more efficient mm. by protecting the gardeners of the forest and in English woodlands, what have we got? We've got deer, we've got badgers. Badgers are seed dispersal agents. People don't realise that they're omnivores, but they eat worms, but they also eat plums and cherries. And so the natural seed dispersal agent for European and British wild cherry and plum trees are badgers and, and foxes too. Yeah, yeah. So people think, oh, protect the woodland for the badgers. They don't think protect the badgers for the next generation of trees that they're going to be the seed dispersal agents for. And mm -hmm. in the tropics, more trees depend on animals, more species of trees depend on animals than in the temperate zone. Between three quarters and 95% of tree species in the tropics have animals as their seed dispersal agent. And they tend to be primates, not just big ones like gorillas, but monkeys and, uh, and birds, the ones yeah. that, that swallow the seeds whole, not, not the parrots that, that actually right. are seed predators. Um, mm -hmm. And those forests are today the result of ecological events that happened centuries ago, when a toucan or a tapir in Latin America or a spider monkey in, in the Amazon rainforest or in Africa, a chimp or a forest elephant or in Asia, uh, an Asian elephant or an orangutan or a gibbon ate a fruit hundreds of years ago, pooped out a seed, and that particular seedling was the one that became a, a massive forest emergent above the height of the rest of the canopy. And those trees are where most of today's carbon sequestration and storage takes place. So planting seedlings is great. You're planting for the next generation. But right now we need to protect those big old trees it's incredible um, how um, people have thought, that actually a huge school of thought of people thinking that we can get on, we're humans, we can get on and use all the animals in the world and we'll get on and create a paradise for ourselves in which we can have everything we want. Um, and actually, you know, as you said in the video, the elephants are in the forest. It's not just the forest has elephants in it. They are the forest. And that's what I like people to think about us as well. Like we are... The world and we we're in it you know your, your tip about being barefoot is 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 exactly that it's just we need to feel that we're in the world and everything natural in the world is incredibly important to us so much more important than the unnatural things it's true but just for, for people who haven't been barefoot for a long time keep an eye. <laughs> there will be thorns there will be sharp bits of stone tread carefully <laughs> but your feet will get used to it eventually and, yeah. and I still get thorns in my feet. Of course, I don't have to pick them out. But um, that's the occasional discomfort and the, the overall pleasure yeah. of that 
tactile sensation. People go, ugh, mud. No, uh, step in mud. Take your shoes and socks off. Enjoy that feeling that's squidging through your toes. <laughs> it's, it's a delight. And, and you watch children do it and you think, oh, kids, you know, they like to play in mud. But it, it's, it's something that adults can benefit from too. So, <laughs> definitely, you know, calling back to our inner child is something that adults should definitely do because it strengthens us. I think so. Because I think most children are, are born naturalists and for some reason they're, they're persuaded it's not important. Yeah. And, and yet yeah, it is. And, and the one good thing that's coming out of this new sort of ecological awareness that, that even the corporate leaders and politicians are beginning to recognize is that it's something that we probably all thought and were taught wasn't important. You know, if you study economics, you're told, taught, taught that nature is an externality. It's not mm -hmm. relevant to the economy that humans have constructed. Whereas anyone with an ounce of common sense, if you think about it, actually exactly. you know, the economy is entirely dependent on nature mm -hmm. and therefore it has to be taken into account. Yeah. And, and there's a remarkable man called Ralph Sharmi who is assistant director of the International Monetary Fund, who is writing about a new economic paradigm where we value nature, living nature, not just the bits that have been cut down and chopped up and made into products that we can buy and sell. And so watch out for a reshaping of the global economy where we will value living nature and the benefits that it brings us and, and hopefully a better distribution of, of the the wealth of the world so that people who can protect nature are paid to protect it rather than at the moment where the only people who come and pay them is people who want to chop down the trees or kill the elephants with ivory or, or dig up the minerals for the machines that we're all using i'm talking to you using machines which have minerals in them that may well have come from gorilla habitat the capacitors in your laptop or mobile device will be coated in tantalum and yet we haven't yet got a, a proper system that protects the habitat, habitat where the tantalum is, um, but still enables the local people to benefit from whatever natural resources they can sustainably extract. That's so amazing. we just have to do things a lot better. We do need to turn everything around. And, and I haven't heard of Ralph Sharmi, and I'd love to talk to you. And maybe we, 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 sh we need to talk again to everyone about, about that in, in more detail, because I've read Dieter Helm's book, and I did actually write um, an essay for to apply for a master's, uh, um, and it was on natural capital. But I haven't heard of Ralph Sharmi, and hopefully he's... Oh, you will. He's going to be pushing him. I will in a minute. I'll read all about him. Um, <laughs> that's fantastic it's been really really amazing talking to you could talk for hours so um hopefully we'll do again soon but um yeah i'd love i do you want to recap on your your barefoot tip uh, sensations no, it's, okay. um, no, no, it's brilliant I mean, if, if, just, just connect with nature mm. connect with nature and recognize the connectivity between nature and us yeah. and the things that we value and, and the role that all those different species, different organisms play, they're not irrelevant. They're not just important because we like the look of them. They're not ornaments. They're part of the, the living biosphere upon which we depend. And it's that realization, which I think, hopefully in the nick of time, will turn things around so that the coming decades will allow nature to restore itself and in doing so, uh, make the planet a better place for us and our children to live in. An easier place to live in oh well, thank you Ian. it's been really wonderful talking to you and um the fact that you've brought such a rich history uh, including uh, your best friend gorillas the grandchildren and the children behind you it's so sweet um and congratulations on your well yeah, i know you said it's you've just things have just happened but congratulations on massive things happening and making such a difference uh, thank you very yeah. much thanks for inviting me it's a pleasure take care bye-bye Thank you for listening to Botanic Shed. We're here to help you build vitality and resilience by building a deeper connection with nature. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook uh, at Botanic Shed and at www.botanicshed.com. My email is hello at botanicshed.com. And if you'd like to speak to any of these people I've interviewed, or if you'd like to join us on the show, do get in touch. Thanks. Bye.